Hi, welcome to the signal pad. Check out what I have here. The awesome engineers at Keysight who saw my video came to the rescue and sent me a replacement part for our MXG repair. Now that's the part that would go over here. There's a lot to talk about, about what's actually going on with that. I've already removed it and that wasn't easy at all. Now you can see from how sophisticated and serious this packaging is that this needs to be handled very carefully. In fact, the thing that is of most concern is that the maximum body temperature of this particular component is, I think it's 240 or 260 degrees Celsius, which is not very high. So reflowing this whole board or using an air gun to put it on is just not going to happen. So we have to find a different way. So this was packaged fairly recently, as you can see, and we're going to have to figure out how to put this in onto this board. Now, I haven't opened this because it does have the moisture sensitivity, so we're going to open this at a later time. So now we have to talk about what's actually going on on this board over here. So I spent some time removing this component and it gets, you can see I made it as plainer as possible. I tried to keep things as clean as possible. Now these packages are extremely sensitive so I had to cover things and very very slowly work my way to remove this package. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges of reassembling this. And if you look at the RF interfaces of this chip, which are the ones that are on the corners here, these are all coplanar waveguide transitions. You can see that we have a ground signal, ground signal, ground signal configuration, and that's true for all of them, which is quite common. Which means that the primary impedance kind of characteristic transformation here is done right here at the edge. But this doesn't mean that this ground is not important. It is very important. We just have to make sure that we have a very nice connection in the perimeter. Now the primary purpose of this is actually thermal because it uh, allows the heat from the component to be passed through the board to the other side. And then you can see we have some thermal vias and an exposed pattern on the other side. And this is true for all of the different components that are actually there. And you place a thermal pad on that side and that connects to the entire chassis. And that's how they take the heat out. The reason they cannot take the heat out from the top is because of the way this is built. Now this may look like a ceramic top, but it's actually not. And this is what happened to the other one the top of it when I was trying to remove it. You can see it got burnt very, very quickly from the hot air gun. Now, this is a cavity on the other side, of course. So these are quite interesting modules on the inside. They're multi-chip uh, micro assemblies, and there's a lot of stuff happening. It's quite beautiful on the inside. We'll take a look at that separately once we get there. So we can't do it this way. So I have to find a way of attaching this where we get a good thermal connection here and a very good solder on the outside. So I considered a few things. Now, right off the bat, a thermal paste is out of the question. These things have far too high thermal resistance in order to be able to take the heat out. The next thing I considered was liquid metal. Now, liquid metal itself is a very interesting topic we should talk about in a different video. These are eutectic metals. A eutectic compound is basically a compound that combines two materials that are solid at a particular temperature, and then when you combine them, they become liquid and go through a phase change at exactly the same temperature. So pretty interesting stuff. So this is a, a liquid made of you know, gallium and a couple of other indium and so on metals combined. This is very nice if you have an area which is electrically isolated because this is conductive. So if I put some of that over here and it seeps in and it touches these pads because it's liquid again, and that means that it's going to touch us, it's going to be very difficult to handle that. So I'm not going to go in that direction. Now the other possibility is to use some of these. These are these chip quick solder, these are amalgams themselves. They're somewhere between the liquid metal and an actual solder. They have a very low melting temperature. So if I put a little bit of that over here, and then I heat it up with a soldering iron from this side, I think I should be able to keep it in a liquid state. And then I just press, press that chip on top of it, just enough so that the bottom is soldered in a way, so it has a good thermal connection. And then I can go around with a soldering iron and attach the corners. So that's my current plan. I think that should hopefully work, and this would give us a good compromise between not having to reflow the whole thing, not subjecting this thing to any more temperature fluctuations, and still get the connections. All right, just opened it. So the humidity indicator still hasn't caught up to the ambient, but yeah, you can see it's completely dry in there. We have the moisture absorbing packs in there, and it should be in this. Here we are. Ah, there it is. Look at that. Tiny little guy. Very nice. Okay, I prepared the area, and if you look carefully, you can see that all the ground has this low temperature solder on it, and all the RF and the biasing have regular leaded solder. So I'm not just going to place that part on top of this, heat it up from the other side until this guy melts, and then all these connections will be hopefully made. And then I'm just going to go in and touch the corner of these from the outside, and again, hopefully they'll reflow and connect to the pads, because the pads are underneath this, there's no pins sticking out. It's basically a completely a surface mount part and from that regards. It's like a QFN package almost. So let's go and hopefully this will yield good result. 
And here we are. It was not a fun experience to try and align this and then clean it and make sure that the solder underneath has flown correctly. It took a lot of work, but I think it looks reasonably okay. I tried to take an x-ray of it, but there's so much metal in this that I got a very poor x-ray out of it. But I could still kind of see that the pins are separate, that the solder hasn't flown in between them. So, and I also soldered it you know, at an angle like that, making sure I could see underneath it. It wasn't completely planar. It went through a, quite a bit of abuse. Let's see if it works. Now, I'm going to actually assemble it completely. Put the thermal pads over here. You can see this is how I used to melt the other side. And before I test it, it's going to be a little bit more work, but I don't want to put this through unnecessary running it without the necessary thermal things. So let's go put it together. All right, here we go. New thermal pads. Okay, it's all put back together. I think the thermal paste are making good contact and the coax is also reassembled. All right, well, here's the moment of truth. So I preset the instrument. Let's do it again. Serious preset. Let's go to low frequencies because the part that we replaced encompasses all the frequencies. Actually, the low frequencies go through it too. So we could have done more damage. Here we go. Yes, that's good. Okay, so no on level at one gigahertz. That means that at least that part of it is still working. Uh, let's go into the frequency and let's increase this. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. Yes, look at that. Beautiful. Oh, this is awesome. It works. Or at least it doesn't give me the unlevel. That is pretty amazing. Uh, let's make sure that the ALC is on. Yep, ALC is also on. This is excellent. Let's hook it up to a spectrum analyzer. Okay, so here's the field fox again. It's on max hold. And we're going to enable the output. So here's our 1 gigahertz tone, 0 dBm. Very nice. And uh, now we can go up one gigahertz at a time and we should be able to have a nice flat response the cable shouldn't have too much loss it's a very good cable and look at that that is awesome there you go that's up to 20 gigahertz that's the maximum this can do and it works absolutely beautifully let's go to 10 gigahertz here and let's increase the amplitude to something higher let's say i think we can do 10 dBm, if I'm not mistaken, there you go. So now we can do exactly the same thing. We should be able to now cover the top of those. There you go. So that's now 10 dBm. So it works. And we should be able to do all the way to the end. Ah, oh, this is awesome. So it works. I'm really happy about that. I think this was an excellent thing. And this was very stressful because I didn't want to disappoint the the Keysight engineers who went out of their way sending me that. So now let's go and take a look at that micro module because it looks really cool on the inside. And here is inside of that micro module. And obviously this is tiny. We're not going to be able to take a, a very good look at it like this. We're going to have to put it under the microscope. So we can get some really beautiful microscope images here because of the nice colors that also the 3.5 devices have as well as the good optics this microscope has. So let's follow the signal along since we already know what the architecture should be of this micro module, we already talked about it in the previous video, so we should be able to follow it. So the signal actually enters over here. You can see they're double wire bonded for reducing inductances. And this is a signal from 0 to 10 gigahertz, essentially, almost that range. And there's some amplification and switching going on in this device. And notice this was made in 1995, Agilent branded. So it goes either this way, going up, or it goes that way down. And we know this because we know there's a front end switch. Okay, so this was working because we were getting the sub 10 gigahertz signals to actually function. So what happens when the signal goes up? Well, when the signal goes up, it just goes through this ceramic transition and then it goes back out. So that's the signals up to 10 gigahertz, which were all working fine, no problem. So it just basically loops around. All these devices, by the way, are made by Agilent and Keysight, of course. Now we go this way. Now, the very first thing we see in attenuator, this helps matching between these devices and conditions the signal to be a little bit more favorable in terms of return losses and standing wave ratios. This is just a maybe a 2 dB, 3 dB attenuator. Or maybe it's actually 3 dB because I think that's what this 3 could possibly mean. Now we go a little bit further. We have a little component which is actually just a decoupling capacitor. Signal comes in. This is a decoupling capacitor and we can focus on it. It has some height, so it's out of focus. There you go. So the top of it is wire bound to the next stage. And this allows essentially uh, to, for us to completely isolate the next stage. And there's some wire bonds flying over. Okay, so we continue on. And then first we have our first amplifier. Okay, so this is again a part made by Agilent. And then after that part, we have a biasing inductor, which looks pretty cool. This is on ceramic. This is also, by the way, another capacitor here. 
there's some resistors for biasing and so on. But yeah, so this is a ceramic piece, it's an inductor, so this is basically the, the bias T. They're basically making a bias T. They're putting the bias through here, it goes this way, and it's AC coupled to the next stage. And this has to be repeated one more time. And you can see it's exactly that. There's yet another amplifier after it with the same kind of bias T. Afterwards, the signal goes out, jumps through this. That's quite capacitive, actually. And then it comes through this device. This is our doubler. Now, this doubler is a classic uh, rectifier-based doubler. And this is quite common. They have this up to 50 gigahertz, this component. It looks really pretty. And then from that, output of that, we go into yet another attenuator. It looks like another 3 dB attenuator for signal conditioning. And here, I believe, is our final stage amplifier. And then from that, we go this way. And then we go out into this guy. So this is our triple switch. Okay, this actually is not by Azure. This is case a make on part here. And there are three, I think these are pin diode switches. There's three of them here, here, and here. And the signal can be turned on and off depending on the configuration of these pin diode switches. Either go this way, or go that way, or go that way. And we know that there are three bandpass filters on this board. And this is how they choose those three bandpass filters. So you can see from this, they go into one of the outputs. Let me get rid of these. And then from the left side, they go through this little transition into another output. And from the other side, they go to this, to the other output. Yeah, so that's actually all there is to it. And uh, again, this is a micro module. Oh, look at this. This is interesting. I wonder if this is what was one of the problems with it. This doesn't look very good. Although this is the only one I see on this one. That's the path that's not being used. Oh, I know, never mind. I know what this is. This is a termination because they all have outputs. These all go outputs. This one doesn't. So I think that's probably may, maybe what they're doing. They're terminating this one. When it's turned off, it goes this way and then gets terminated into this. So it looks really nice. I love these little devices. We can look a bit closer to this one if you want. Here we go. A beautiful blue color. And this is an amplifier as well. We have two stages. These are all the biasing and so on. Again, at some point, I can sit down and go through one of these and actually draw out the schematic for one of these devices if you really want to. We can tell the DIC microscopy on so we can see some more interesting features if I do that. There we go. So we can bring out some of the other features of this out a little bit more. You can see surface roughness. We can see the different layers and materials a little bit better. You can see how the gold surface of these components have this crystalline structure on top of them. Yeah, really nice, beautiful stuff. So I think we understand the architecture of this fairly well, which is not surprising because we already knew what to expect from inside of this and now we can see it in action and there was no way that I was going to repair this by hand so I'm very grateful that uh, this uh, replacement was made possible. I'm curious what has changed in that replacement because they obviously have updated some of these devices. This is a fairly old one. This is uh, from year 2000, you can see made from 2000. If you look at some of these part numbers, you actually find them in the semiconductor profile that Keysight does offer. This one I couldn't find, but I found the 20 to 40 gigahertz version of the same one. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this repair. I'm very happy that we could conclude this one actually, and we got to see what's inside the micro module and do a bit of analysis on it. Let me know in the comment section what you think about this and what you thought about the journey to get here and any other suggestions you may have on the things you would like to see. As always, I'll see you next time.